Welcome to the Talent Empowerment Podcast, where we support business education through the stories of great humans. Let's borrow their vision, their tools, their tactics to lift up your own purpose and find happiness within your organization, your teams, and your community. I'm your host, The Real Tom Finn, and on the show today, we have a master sales and public speaking guru. His name is Tom Jacobs. Tom, welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, thanks for having me, Tom. The Tom Show. The Tom and Tom Show, yes. Uh, we will try not to do that too often during our discussion today. Um, but if you don't know Tom Jacobs, let me take just a moment to introduce you to him. He's known as the impact pilot for helping business owners sell their services better through public speaking, training, and a unique sales process, which incorporates questions that sell, and quite frankly, stories that sell. So we're going to get under the hood on how to incorporate questions, how to sell, how to sell with stories. And you're gonna ask yourself, well, what's he been doing? Well, over the last 30 years, he's been an entrepreneur, owned a dozen businesses, had exits from businesses, and his biggest realization in business is that sales is a process. We're gonna get into all things sales and sales process, but let's for a moment just back up. Tell me a little bit about the time you decided to become an entrepreneur. Very good question. And I think it was when I was 15 or 16 years old and I was apprenticing at a DJ uh, business, well, one DJ, <laughs> doing weddings and uh, homecomings, bar mitzvahs and all sorts of fun stuff. And uh, then I didn't like him very much. And so I decided to go out on my own and start my own DJ business and string quartet. And I was 16 years old, and that's when I first kind of realized what direct response marketing was as well. Let's tell you a quick story here. Um, I would go through the Sunday paper when they actually had a paper, and I would go through the wedding announcements, so the engagement yep. announcements. Mm -hmm. I would look up the bride, and so I'd find the bride's name. I'd go to this thing called the White Pages. I remember. So it's yeah. a big book that they gave all the phone numbers, addresses, and names of everybody in the town. Can you imagine doing that now? And so I would go in, I'd find the person's address, and I would send her a letter saying, hey, I got this, um, congratulations on being married. I got this uh, offer for you. We could do a string quartet. We can do a DJ. And that kind of took me through high school and, and college. So were you a DJ on the ones and twos? I mean, this is like before the, the Mac computer was uh, a DJ's, you know, favorite instrument. What, what were yes. you actually using? I was using Pioneer uh, turntables, two turntables and a mic. I learned to rap like, never mind, I can't rap, but yeah, two, it wasn't two, that two, type two of DJ. Two turntables and a microphone. Is that Run DMC? It is. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So the, <laughs> right. Yeah, it was ones and twos on vinyl. I had to carry vinyl with me. I'm so jealous of all the DJs now. They just roll up with a flash drive. Yeah. yeah. Pull up a flash drive on your Apple and you're you're ready to rock and roll. Okay, so we yeah. started we started with some direct marketing and yeah. we figured out how to uh build a market through uh selling through a simple letter uh to the bride and just say, Hey, I can help. Um, which at that time was probably super helpful because the internet didn't exist. So for them to get a phone number and a guy uh, was was pretty helpful. So what happened at that business um, at the end of high school? So I went on to college and was uh, doing that during college as well. So that helped me kind of pay, pay for college a little bit. And then it just kind of fizzled out because I was in a different city and, and you know school work and all that. And then finally, I um, I got a degree in uh, theater management, which was uh, probably a mistake. But because <laughs> like the first job offer that I had out of college was for fifteen thousand a year um, as a full time box office manager at an off loop theater in Chicago. Wow! And I have two really bad habits that need to be maintained, and that's eating and living inside. And at $15,000 <laughs> a year in Chicago, downtown Chicago, that's really difficult to do. Without I'm not sure like you can even get a room things. for fifteen grand a year uh, no. in Chicago, which which is a great city. Shout out to all my friends in Chicago. Uh, love Chicago. But 
you got to have a little bit of coin to be able to yeah. uh, to live there. So did you take the job at fifteen grand a year? No, no, no. I ditched my, my degree and I went to work for oil and gas of all things and did inventory management for twelve years and logistics for twelve years. Yeah, well, look, there's some there's some coin in oil and gas. Uh, so so says so says everybody in oil and gas. Um, yeah. Well, I think that's great. So you uh, you got your degree in something that was irrelevant. I'm not going to go into like this whole discussion about college education because I think it's going to take us off track, uh, and I really want to get to sales process items. But before we get to sales process and selling and how to tell your story, I want to get to uh, your business in Houston, and mm -hmm. you you opened and and had a gym, and tell us the story about sort of gaining ownership of the gym, walk us through what happened in your sort of entrepreneurial journey that started change. And then my goodness exited, which is sort of the entrepreneurial dream. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, even while I was working in corporate America, I was, I still had side hustles. So before side hustles was a word. Um, and, but I always had that net, that, that safety net of the corporate job that kept me from really taking some risks in starting a business and owning a business. And uh, ultimately, you know, working, you know, 12 hours a day in a corporate environment, I, I got overweight, got really unhealthy. And at 30 years old, my doctor said I had high blood pressure, high cholesterol. And if I continued down the route that I was going, I would be lucky to see 40. And he said, well, you, you have a choice. You can, you can take these pills, which I really recommend that you do, or you can do this thing called diet and exercise, but nobody does that. So let's, let's get you on the pills. And I'm stubborn. I like a challenge. So I was like, oh, what's this thing that nobody does? I think I'll do that. Diet and exercise. So I found a program. It was called Body for Life. It was in like 2000, 2001. And they were offering $100,000 to the best body transformation in 12 weeks. So I entered the contest 12 weeks later, I lost 40 pounds of fat, gained 10 pounds of muscle, had the before and after picture, had the tear stained letter that I wrote to uh, the folks, sent it away. They sent me back an envelope and inside the envelope was a extra large t-shirt and congratulations for finishing. I didn't win the hundred thousand, but I got an extra large t-shirt, which was extra large. I wear a medium now. <laughs> So I don't it was know a little big at that point, right? Because you had just big. lost like, pounds. No, I get it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a tough uh, that's a tough look for a weight loss company yeah. that sends yeah. you the wrong like an oversized T shirt. Hey oversized guys, this right. would have been great twelve weeks ago, but now I'm lean <laughs> yeah. and mean. You're right. But through that process, I I fell in love with fitness, and that was then. I got personal trained as a personal trainer. People were always asking, you know, like, what are you taking? What are you doing? Like, what's your secret? Yeah. And, and I figured, well, I could make a business out of this. So I started personal training people in the evening before work at lunchtime and just absolutely loved it. But the day job was kind of getting in the way of my passion of helping people. And so finally I decided to quit the day job. I, I found a studio that was for sale in Houston. And so I, I dumped out my entire 401k. I borrowed money from bank of mom and dad and opened up and I bought, bought the facility and then quickly expanded it as well, doubled the size of it because, you know, I knew a lot about running a small business. And within the first six months, I was just about broke because I didn't know the fundamentals of running a small business, which you have to wear tons of hats. Now, I'd been negotiating millions of dollars in, in rail freight um, for, for oil and gas companies for 12 years, but I knew, didn't know the first thing about running a small business. And so it quickly was, was failing. And I identified that the reason I was failing is because I couldn't sell. I, I, I couldn't close a door. Uh, in, in that business. And once I won, I hired a business coach to help me kind of have a second set of eyes looking on the business and help me navigate what a small business is like. But through that, I started to do a lot more research on selling and what it really takes to sell 
fitness specifically, <clears throat> but really it's a, you know, a personal service. And when you're selling a personal service, it, you can't just rely on the, the program itself to sell itself, right? You have to like ask questions and you have to tell stories and you have to like convince that person that they need to make a change. And once I learned the techniques of doing that, the whole business took off. You know, the, the first year I did like a hundred thousand in, in revenue. The second year was 400,000 in revenue in the second year running a business. So it was, it, and it all came down to learning how to sell and having a repeatable process of selling. Yeah. And we're going to get to that, uh, pretty shortly here, but I, I do want to sort of unpack a couple of those nuggets that you just shared, because for those entrepreneurs out there, a couple of the things you said were super, super important. So one of the first things that I heard was you bought an existing business and then you, um, you unloaded your 401k and entrepreneurs know this journey, but not, not everybody in corporate roles knows this journey, right? They're thinking, no, no, I stack my 401k so that I can retire. And ultimately when I retire, that's when I'll be happy. So right. if you're in that mindset, that survivor mindset, and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm 30, I'm 40, I'm 50, I'm 60, whatever. It doesn't matter how old you are. And you're just stacking 401k because one day you're going to be happy. Probably the wrong way to look at the world. You got to find those great careers that you love now. Uh, Cause who knows how long we're going to be here, right? Um, 100%. We, we never know. We got to find joy and happiness and love along the way uh, because that's super important. All right. So enough of that. Let's go right to this idea that you expanded right away. So as a business owner, we want to do bigger than the guy before us. We want to do more. We want to, I, oh yeah, I got this. Let's blow that wall out and add some squat racks. Um, yeah. Okay. So what happened? What was the mindset there where you were thinking, okay, I, I got to do something different. I got to expand. Yeah. So the mindset was, um, I got to have more things because that will attract more people. Mm -hmm. And so I got more, more cardio equipment. I got Pilates machines. I built out a small aerobic studio where we could do uh, yoga and step and combat and body pump and all, all the different group X classes. Sure. And then, you know, I had the regular training floor where then I had open gym membership for $30 a month and was doing personal training in that same space with the mindset that the more things that are happening, the busier we are, the more money I make. The sad truth was I was super busy 15 hours a day, but at the end of the month, I had no money. The money was coming in, but going out just as fast. And that was, you know, if I were to do it over again, I would one focus on one, maybe two things, do those really well, go a mile deep, but an inch thin, and then slowly expand out rather than going a mile wide and then just not doing everything very well. Yeah. That, I feel like that's going to be the quote that's on all social media. Um, <laughs> I just, I'm listening to you and I'm thinking that that is the advice. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen around this show, but I got to tell you folks, that's the advice that you need to take away from Tom Jacobs is do not go a mile wide and an inch thick. You've got to be really focused. The, the problem is, and here's where we trick ourselves, Tom, is we, we say, well, well, I could do that. I'm good at that. I could add that service. I can add this service. I can, I can add this product. And oh my gosh, what if somebody wants it and I don't have it? And that we trick ourselves. That never works. You got to go, as Tom just said, you've got to go really deep and narrow. And that's the way you start your business. Um, so pro tip yeah. uh, for those of you out there. Yeah. In, in defining who your target audience is, and I have this conversation a lot with business owners and that they're afraid to be in a niche and say, I specialize in helping women 35 to 40 who are high achievers. They're at the top of their game, but they're just not happy with their health and fitness. 
that was my target audience, like a 35 to 40 year old woman who was an executive at a major corporation and, but just gave everything to everybody, but not to herself. And once I got, and, and this is the, the, the mind tricks that we play with ourselves. It's like, well, but what if a guy comes in and he's 25 years old and wants to train? I, you mean, I have to turn him away. No, you don't have to turn them away. It's just that your targeting and your marketing is so specific that other people are going to say, wow, he must be really good with that demographic. I wonder if he could help me too. And that's exactly what the conversation ends up being. And, and you're adding more people to your, to your group by being very specific and laser focused on who you can help. So once you define your target market, what was it that got you over the hurdle so you were able to exit this business and sell it? Yeah, so it, it all came down to what is a sellable asset in terms of a like personal training or a personal service? If I were the business, it would not be worth very much because once you're removed, then the business goes away. Yep. So I spent, before I sold the business, I spent a good three years preparing the business for sale. And part of that was taking me off the floor. So, and actually I did that in five years. Uh, the last five years, I didn't train one, a single soul in my fitness center. So I took myself off of training and doing and being in the business and rather work on the business. And I worked on process and procedures. And so when the new owners came aboard, I was like, here's your process book. And it was, you know, a three inch thick binder and said, every process about this business is in here. And they're like, oh my gosh, it's all done for me. I don't have to do anything. It's, and the value goes way up in yeah. that business because then it's, it's the process. It's not dependent on, you know, what's in somebody's head. Yeah. And for those of you that are trying to think through how you develop a process, what you do is you develop it through trial and error in a way. And Tom's idea of a notebook is a perfect visual because you can, you can kind of think of the three ring notebook, um, and blank pages. And once you start to get a process, you just write it down. And then you write the next one down, you scratch it out and you write the next one down. And, but the, here's the problem. You don't write the whole manual on day one because you just don't know, and things are going to change. Right, Tom. And 100%. you've got, you've got to do it over time. And that's why it takes five years to write the process manual. Yeah. I, and, and that's exactly the process I went through Tom too, which is, is hilarious. I had a blank binder at the front desk and I told the entire staff, said, if the, the thought in your head goes, Tom, how do I, then you need to put that into the book. Mm -hmm. So anytime you start a sentence with Tom, how do I, and then, and we put that on the outside of the binder, the Tom, how do I question mark. And then that way I knew what processes that people needed to be able to do their job because they were asking me the question and really no employee should ever ask you the question of how do I do my job? they should know because they have a process procedures and, and all that is, is handled. Yeah. And they've been trained appropriately along the way and continue to be trained and developed and all of those, uh, those good things. So, so let's switch gears from, uh, you as the entrepreneur to, um, somebody who has spent 30 years, uh, trying to figure out how to build effective sales processes, um, from, from the days on the ones and twos as a local <laughs> DJ. Uh, all the way to today. So help me understand this idea of a personal story. What is this first step? This What's a personal story? So a personal story is, is a story that has happened to you that you use to help relate to your prospects. And that's whether you're doing one-on-one -on -one sales conversations or you're doing a, a presentation to a hundred or a thousand people having that personal story creates a connection with your audience. And again, whether that's one person or a thousand people, because now they get to know who you are, what drives you. And typically that story has to do with your why, 
why are you in the business that you're in? Why are you selling the products that you're selling or the service that you're selling? And when people understand your why, and Simon Sinek says this brilliantly, much better than I, I can, but we, they will buy your why a lot more than they'll buy the how or the what, what you do or how you do it. Nobody cares. But really, they want to know that, one, you care about them and you're going to help them get to the result that they want. Not the result that you want, but the result that they want. Yeah, big distinction. Uh, yeah. The result that they want uh, and understanding yeah. the why. Okay, so a personal story is all about my personal why, but how does that relate to my business? Because this is where it gets a little tricky for people. It does. And there's always a nice, it's usually a fr pretty easy bridge to make between the story and the business and, and why you're telling that story. It's not, and, and you're not telling the story in just a way to either brag about what your achievements are or to get sympathy for a tragedy that you went through. You're, you're telling that story in a way that the audience can relate to it. So you're bringing that audience into the story with you. They see you as the hero in that story but then they can see themselves as the hero in that in that story and you as the guide that takes them along the journey to the result that they ultimately want. Wow. Uh, and how does somebody actually go about writing this vision and starting this story? Because I, I think I get it conceptually, and I think most of our listeners would get it conceptually. But the hard work is transferring from the brain to the hand. Um, so when we go from brain to hand, there's a little bit of a disconnect at times. So how do I actually, do I get a piece of paper out and a pen and just start jotting my notes down? How do I do this? Yeah. So the, the first step is one, identifying what that story is. And so the first thing that I always have people do is take a, a story inventory of their life. So events that have happened to them or for them. And, and what the, just all they need to do is just write down what the event is, maybe just a little synopsis of it. And they could be tragedies, they could be comedies, they could be rom-coms, it could be all sorts of different stories that you have in your life. Don't always think that they have to be the near-death experience story or, you know, you won a, the lottery for a billion dollars, whatever. But it just needs to be a story of something that's happened to you in your life. And then you list out all those different stories. And then what I typically have people do is go through and relive that moment that they were in. And, and I have them do that in front of me, whether it's on a zoom call or, or in person. And I look for their reactions. And typically when they find a story that is emotionally charged for them, then that's the story that we want to dive into. So I'm going to see them maybe fidget in their seat a little bit, rearrange things or, or, their heartbeat, heartbeat goes up. They start to breathe a little bit differently. Their palms are sweaty. And I ask them, like, are there stories where you, you felt a physical reaction as you were thinking about it? And they go, like, yeah, this one, this one, this one. I was like, oh, great. Which one was more? Like, well, that one was. And like, great. That's the one we're doing. So they're like, oh, no, I can't tell that story <laughs> is usually the reaction. Like, why not? Like, don't people deserve to know how you overcame that or how that, you know, comedy, you know, it's framed your life going forward. Like, well, yeah, maybe, but so that's, that's the first step. And then the second is just, just write it out freehand. Like what, what, what did you feel like? What was going on? And then we just go through a revision process of adding what I call color and texture to the story. So all those di little different details that are in the story. And, and I always like to say, you know, and I'll ask you, Thomas, you know, yesterday I was in the car and went to the store, right? So I say I was in a car, I went to the store. What car are you thinking of, Tom? I'm thinking of a blue 1988 four-door Volvo. Okay, but that wasn't the car that I was in. So it was blue, but it was a 1989 BMW 325i that had rust all over it. So in that aspect, I use that example, because if you just say, oh, I was in a car, you're not bringing the audience in. So the color and texture is I was in my 1989 blue BMW that's seen better days. And now 
you're with me on yeah. that journey on the story. So yeah. we always want to bring in those nice, rich details so that people are in the story with you. Okay. So back up for a second, because I, yeah. I love this process. So I'm, I'm writing down my stories of my life, good, bad, indifferent. We find the one that I get emotionally charged around. But if you were to ask me to do that and you gave me, oh, I don't know, 90 minutes or so, I'd probably have, oh gosh, a, a few pages of stories for you. I, I mean, sure. let's just ballpark it. I'm going to make this up, but let's just say 20. Okay. Sure. I got 20 different major life events that I've been through. How do I, how do I know? I, I know it's the emotional charge, but how do I know which one to pick? And can you pick three? Is it four sure. stories? Is it five? Is it one? How do you, how do you do that part? You know, generally it's, you know, even with a list of 20, you're going to find up to probably three or four that are going to have the most emotionally charged to you. And then we'll go through those stories. And a lot of times we'll draft out all three of those or all four of them and then see which fits into the presentation that you're ultimately going to be giving. So whether that's a sales presentation or, or a, a talk. Um, and, and with that information, now we can kind of figure out which one is the most relevant for your audience, for the product that you're selling or the end result that you want from either the one-on-one -on -one interaction or from the, the speech that you might be giving. So let's, uh, let's target this around <clears throat> a sales presentation because mm -hmm. a lot of people do them. And Tom, in our sales presentation, we're going to be doing it over Zoom because we're in a uh, digital world and we all connect through digital mediums now. Uh, so we're delivering to an audience, a buyer, that buyer is a business buyer. So a business to business interaction, they're buying through zoom. We haven't met in person yet. Um, and how do I, how do I bridge this gap again between my story that you just took me through and actually selling something or maybe said differently, how do I not make this sound like this is all about me and I love me some me, right? And I spend the first 15 minutes just standing there saying, let me just tell you some more about me. Yeah. Yeah. So one, it would never be 15 minutes. So um, we'll, we generally develop three versions of the story, the, the elevator pitch or the elevator story, um, and then maybe like a five minute and then a 15 minute version of it. Mm -hmm. And generally in a sales presentation where it's one-on-one, -on -one, you want to use that three to five minute version of it. And what you're, what you're accomplishing with that. And, and it's not like you just start the conversation. Let me tell you more about me. It's like, you know, that situation you're talking about reminds me of a similar situation that I went through. And then you go through what that situation was and then what you learn from it and say, you know, maybe you relate to this as well in terms of the problem that you're having and, and how we can ultimately solve that. I've been where you're at. I know exactly what you're going through. Well, that's, uh, that makes all the sense in the world. I feel like this is a really nice playbook. So you, okay. So we've got three different versions. We've got our elevator, we've got our three to five, and then I'm going to call it our, our Ted talk, uh, yes. which is 15 minutes, right? Yeah. So for those of you that love the stage and uh, want to be mic'd up, um, your TED Talk is 15 minutes. Okay, so we've got these three versions, and then we use them in a repeatable way. Do We do this over and over and over and over again, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's say I meet with somebody in this sales discussion. We go through the first discussion, and, and there's some wonderful people on the other end, and I, I tell them my three to five. And then they say, hold on, I need to get a couple other people from our company on to, to make a decision. And they come back on, I tell the same story again, or do I have to go to story B or C? Um, I would go to story B or C. So as to keep everybody engaged in the story, I might reference that story, the original A story, um, just as a reference for the people that were, that heard that story previously, but I would, for new people coming in, I would tell a different story 
or focus on a customer story, which is the other stories that you need to have as well, is customer success stories. You have your own personal story, why you're in the business. And then the second would be how you've helped people uh, previously. Okay. Is there a third? No, just those two. Just those two. So a little bit about me and my personal story, and then a couple of anecdotal stories around customers and how we've helped other people. And we leave it at that. Yeah. What do you say to those that um, are on the opposite view of this? Hey, look, my product's awesome. I'm awesome. I just show up and tell them everything's awesome. Yeah. Good. How's that working for you? (laughs) (laughs) Well, for some people with a gifted product, it might work, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, there are products that sell itself. Um, But ultimately, to be at that whole nother level, it's understanding what the problem is of the prospect. So that's where the questioning comes in very, very important, is to ask the questions to identify what the problem is. And these questions aren't necessarily for you, the salesperson. The questions are really for the prospect to hear themselves say, Mm. I have a problem doing this. And once they verbalized it, now they're in the mode of looking for a solution and your product service is that solution. So then when you go through the presentation of how you've helped other people and maybe a little bit about your why, then you can say, and we're going to solve all those problems that you have right now by implementing this new product. Nice. Nice. So where do the questions come in? So after we're back on the sales presentation, we're in a digital format, we're on Zoom, it's a business to business environment, and we're trying to sell a product or service. So when I start the discussion, it usually starts with how you doing? Where are you from? Where are you calling in from today? And we get through some pleasantries. I love your background, whatever it is, right? And then there's that moment where everybody pauses and it's go time. So yep. at that point, do you take control and start to ask questions or do yes. you jump right into, this is my personal story? How does somebody navigate those two things? So first I would lay out the agenda. So I would tell them what to expect out of this call or out of this meeting. So first I'm going to ask you some questions about your business. I'll like try to figure out if we can even help you. If I determine that I can help you or we can help you, then I'm going to show you a little bit of our program. And then at the end of the call, we can make a decision if we want to go forward or not. Sound fair? So that's just laying out the agenda. And then I would go and take control by asking those questions because the person who is asking the most questions is actually in control of the conversation. And I have a simple four question framework and it's called what, why, what, why? So those are the four questions. What, why, what, why? You're done. There you go. So the first one is what, what are you wanting to accomplish? What are your goals? What are you wanting to accomplish? What's in, and, and really you're driving towards what's the problem, right? The second is why is that important to you? Why is that goal important to you for, for your company? And, and remember, even with B2B sales, you're selling to a person. It's yeah. person to person. And by understanding not only the driver of the person, but the driver of the company as well, you're going to be much, much more successful because that person has a driver themselves. They want to keep their job. They want to get a promotion. They want to, you know, whatever, um, advance in their career. The companies might have a similar goal, but you have to sell to both of those goals and you have to figure out what those are. And so that's why the what, why, first, what, why? What are the goals? Why are they important to you? The third one is what have you done or what are you currently doing to try to hit that goal? And this is critical because now you're finding out how they failed in the past because clearly they failed because they wouldn't be sitting in front of you if they were super successful and didn't have any problems. And then the last, the why is one of the most critical ones. uh, I believe and that's why save it to last is why is now, the right time for you to change or for you to make a a change or to invest in a different program. And that is to get rid of the, Oh, let me think about it. (laughs) The objection that all salespeople hate 
let me think about it. Well, you just said that now's the right time because you're losing five grand a month in revenue and you only have like three more months to, to go before you go broke. So is it a now thing or a later thing? Because to me, it sounds like it's a now thing. Yeah. And that timing piece at the end of the, of, of the four questions, I think is really important because it sort of ties a bow on the conversation. I, I tend to find um, when I talk to people about this, that that one can end up being a bit of a sticking point though. It, it sounds great in theory, mm. but if somebody says, well, uh, I don't know, right? Mm. What, what do you do with the, I don't know. I don't know about the timing. I don't know how to do that. I'm not sure. You know, there's a lot of, um, at times there's a lot mm. of people that are indecisive because they have yeah. a scarcity mentality and they don't want to create change within their organization for fear of making a mistake. So yeah. how do you deal with that last question when you get the ums and ahs? Yeah. So it's it, like that, that fear and that of that individual. And remember you're selling to people, mm -hmm. not selling to the company. That person has a fear. And so you have to identify what that fear is and, and actually bring it out on the table. It's like, wow, you know, Tom, it sounds like you're a little fearful of making a decision. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? What's, what's driving that? Well, I made a bad decision and I'm on like probation right now. It was something like that. It's like, oh, tell me, oh, I'm really sorry to hear that, but tell me about that decision and what went wrong so that we don't make that same mistake again, because I'm in this with you together. Right. So you're creating that same side of the table with them and helping them achieve their goal. And that's that's really what sales to me is all about is one, finding that common ground and solving the problem together with your solution. And that's also a nice tie into the personal story, because then you can go and you know, after you've asked some of those questions and you can kind of weave in that story. It's like, oh, yeah, I totally I understand, like. Three years ago, I was going through a similar situation that you are. And then you go into your three to five minute story. Okay. So we, what, why, what, mm -hmm. why? So we yep. do that twice. Yep. And then we've got enough information to start to share a little bit about us and tie it into the what, why's. That's right. And then at that point, we've, will be able to see the reactions, open up the dialogue. Hopefully they'll have a little bit of a connection where they'll start to engage more in a open dialogue. And then ultimately that's when you can share perhaps some customer stories, or if they have a question about a product, or I saw this on your website, can that help us? Then you sort of open up this sales dialogue. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. All of that straightforward, beautiful playbook. How do you end the call? So typically you want to make a decision on that call. So make it a, a one call <laughs> that's the most efficient. And because you laid out the agenda is, you know, at the end of our discussion, I'll ask you to make a decision. And you can even preface that with, you, you can say yes or no, either's okay, but I would like you to make a decision today. Is that okay? And th you say that up front so that then like you understand it's like, well, we can't make a decision today. So then you know up front, well, okay, there's no decision made. Let's figure out what the next step is in the sales process for this organization. And now you already are primed to kind of tee up that next meeting. Uh, but I always laying out that agenda that there should be a decision made at the end so that you know, there, there's no ambiguity then, there's no follow-up. It's just like, you know, Tom, I, I really like you, but I don't think this is the right fit for us. And then you can, you can do some objection handling if necessary, but you are going to get a decision when you lay it out like that. Nice. What are, what are the risks or the things that you hear the most from others, Tom, when they go through this? The, um, the sales presentation or the story part? I think this tying in the story into a sales presentation. Cause that's really where the, the rubber meets the road. It's, yeah. it's combining all of this into some sort of active business discussion. Yep. Yeah. So a lot of people feel that, well, this is a business discussion, so I shouldn't bring in personal, personal stuff, mm -hmm. whether that's a comedy or a tragedy, but again, we're selling to people and people will buy from other people. 
So it's important to create that connection and have them understand why you do what you do. And so that's get rid of any fear that it's, you know, obviously you don't want to tell an inappropriate story. <laughs> that would just, that's, you know, some common sense. And I know common sense isn't all that common, but, you know, just read your audience and know what, what version of the story that or which story to use uh, with that audience. Um, so, you know, it's, it's always going to be appropriate for the audience. So with the upside of creating a, a stronger connection with that, you know, with the, the client. And, you know, I, I was, when I was in corporate, I was buying um, freight from railroad companies and they spent so much money on relationship building. Like I, I was, you know, dinner on, you know, vintage rail cars that would go down the coast of California. Mm. Nothing about freight or anything like that, but they just wanted to give us an experience. And they would tell stories about, you know, grandpa who was a foreman on, at Union Pacific and, and why they just love the railroad. They have, and, and I was like, this is really, you know, thinking back to it now, I didn't know it, what was going on then, but now it's like, after I've been doing the storytelling and the sales, I'm like, that was brilliant. That was like classic storytelling within a sales environment yeah. to get your clients to know, like, and trust you. And it worked. And it worked. And I imagine that this process works also for many, many people out there. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, look, Tom, I've got about 14 other questions, but we are absolutely smack dab out of time. Uh, so if you want to learn more from Mr. Tom Jacobs and you want to learn how to tell your own story, uh, find your own purpose, build your own vision, uh, create this magic with others, uh, whether it's in business to business, business to consumer, you just want to be a better friend. You want to have more fun at dinner parties. All of those things, uh, can come into play when you start telling your own story, the way that you want to frame that story. And uh, I think it's a, it's an absolute must have for anybody in modern day is to understand, know, and be able to deliver your story with precision. This has been a bit of a masterclass uh, on how to get this done. So I thank you very, very much for, uh, for joining the show, Tom. Absolutely. No worries. Well, look, uh, if you want to find Tom, you're going to have to go find him on the internet. Tom, where do we, uh, where do we find you, track you down, and uh, otherwise stalk you when we need help with sales? <laughs> the best place is my website. It's connected to all socials as well. So it's uh, tomjacobs.com, T-O-M-J-A-C-K-O-B-S.com. Looks like Jacobs, but spelled or pronounced Jacobs. Yep, we'll, uh, we'll get that in the show notes. So if you're driving... Please keep your eyes on the road and your hands, uh, and we will get that in the show notes. And you can just click a button and be right with Tom on his website. Uh, and Tom, thank you so much for joining the Talent Empowerment Podcast. This show has been absolutely uh, front and center in sales, very prescriptive, very helpful. And uh, thank you for empowering our audience with, with all of this knowledge. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Okay, my friends. Thank you for joining the Talent Empowerment Podcast. I hope you transform your business by placing humans at the center, finding your own sales story, finding the right questions to ask, and innovating at scale. Let's get back to people and culture together. We'll see you on the next episode.